So I very much look forward to the conversation that Kate will lead with our three, three larger than life honorees. Um, it's a real treat for us to have you back here. Uh, Clarence and Sonia, we decided to go informal. They're here celebrating their reunions. And uh, Sam, you're going to be able to see Judge Garth later on. He's uh, moved up to, uh, to Branford. So we, we hope your whole weekend goes wonderful, and we're very excited that we have uh, less than an hour and a half, but some time to get to know you better. Uh, my questions are going to proceed in three parts. First, we want to learn about your lives off the bench, then about your careers before you joined the Supreme Court, and finally, some questions about your work on the court. If there's a commonality, that, if, if there's a common theme, it's the commonalities uh, between you in some respects. So, Robert spoke of your backgrounds, and we surely all took note that none of you came from a family of lawyers. You each chose this path uh, with some uh, independence and grit. And so I'm going to ask you about where you got that grit to serve the law. Sonia, let me begin with you. You're quoted as saying, I was going to go to college, and I was going to become an attorney, and I knew that when I was 10. No jest. I want to ask you not so much what made you want to be an attorney, but what did becoming a lawyer mean for you as, at that tender age of 10? Oh, I thought you were going to ask, <laughs> has it meant to me? Um, to say what I was thinking at 10 wasn't terribly sophisticated. Um, but I understood, uh, despite the repetitive theme of the Perry Mason shows, which are what introduced me to lawyers, um, each of the cases that I heard from week to week was different. They were different people doing different kinds of work, interested in different parts of the world and in, of the society they were in. And I had a sense that the law gave one that opportunity to learn new things constantly. In fact, in high school, I worked in an office with, it, back then it was one man and a bunch of women, okay? And in the business office of a hospital. And I used to relieve them during the summer when they went on vacation. And I knew from the repetitiveness of the work that I wanted something that would be constantly stimulating. I wasn't thinking back then in the global terms I subsequently developed. Yeah. Um, and so that has changed. It's what law is to me now and what made me choose it ultimately in terms of for sure the career I was going to do after college. And was that it was service. We will uh, we'll hear, hear more about what it's become to you. Um, Sam, uh, your Princeton yearbook quotes you as having said that you would dream someday of warming a seat on the Supreme Court. Now, I don't know if you really said that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, is there some aspect of your early life or maybe early professional experience that's particularly important in achieving that? I did say it. It was a joke. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was thinking of saying he dreams of playing in the World Series, and I might have said that just as uh, both uh, ideas. You would have preferred that. Seemed to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you have gone to baseball camp, right? Bas I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> but both ideas would seem uh, probably equally plausible at that point. Uh, a couple of things got me interested in in the law. I had no lawyers in my family, but my father. Uh, did research for the New Jersey legislature. So he was drafting laws, and he used to discuss that with us. That seemed very interesting. After uh, Reynolds versus Sims was decided, he had the, the job of drawing new legislative districts and new congressional districts 
for the state, and he would discuss that as well. And I still can remember uh, lying in bed and listening to the, the clank of the mechanical adding machine that he was using. This shows you how much technology has changed, but he was doing different, different maps to, to make equal uh, districts with equal population just using this uh, mechanical uh, adding machine down on the kitchen table. So that was one thing. The other thing that got me interested in law was debating. I, I debated in high school, and one year, the debate topic, the national high school debate topic, had to do with a constitutional criminal procedure question. And it just fascinated me. I remember that there was a little book put out that provided arguments on both sides of, the, uh, of this question that was written by someone who at the time was labeled as a law clerk for, I believe, for justice on the California Supreme Court. And the name of this, that was the first time I think I ever saw the word law clerk. The name of this individual was Lawrence Tribe. That was the first book <laughs> I think that he has, that he wrote. So that, those were two of the things that really got me interested to start out. Great. Clarence, unlike your colleagues, uh, you once said that you never wanted to be on the court, that you prefer a private and anonymous life. Um, what changed your mind, are you, and are you glad you changed it? Oh, I don't know if I ever changed my mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think what changed is, uh, is you, this reflex. When the president calls, you always say, yes, Mr. President, and that sort of gets you, gets you into these Forrest Gump situations. But. Um, <laughs> You know, I, the, I was just reflecting on my colleagues. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here with them. Um, it, it's a bit overwhelming, I have to be honest with you. And it's a particular honor to be here with my wife, Virginia, who's totally my best friend in the world. Um, this is certainly far more special than, at the time, what I thought my graduation was. Um, the, I did not think about being a lawyer. Um, I thought about being a priest. That was my dream. When you're an altar boy, the next step is to determine whether you have a vocation and then go on at that time to the minor seminary. And that was a major change in my life in 1964. And you went to seminary in, for a year? I went to seminary for four years. Four years. Uh, including my first year of college. And then the late 1960s happened and a lot of things happened in the summer of 1968, including loss of vocation and loss of faith. And then you start thinking, what do I do? Uh, where do I look? How do I help? And that's when the idea, you refl I reflected back on uh, people like um, Atticus Finch, was the only lawyer I knew anything about in To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, I knew about Max from Native Son. Uh, and, and so these were the things that played out in your mind in the 1960s. And those of us who were there in the late 1960s cannot say we were thinking straight about a whole lot of things. <laughs> and even if we were not using illegal substances. Um, it was a different time. And what I wound up with was working in the community. That was a common theme for all of us. So I wound up at New Haven Legal Assistance, but the whole effort was to come here and go back to Savannah. And Yale was actually quite good because very naively, I think you said, Sonia, that your thinking at 10 was unsophisticated. Well, my thinking at 20 was unsophisticated. And I I think Yale took me up when I, I think in my application, and I'm just paraphrasing, I said that I was, real, I was quite taken by the law and I was excited and to learn about it. And that has actually continued. I mean, they, someone who read that actually believed me. And it must have sound particularly naive, but it was true and it's still true to, today. And what has changed is that I think we you know, I'm 66, I'm not 20 anymore, I'm not 21, and I feel as strongly about it after all the experiences, uh, and more idealistic perhaps now than I did back, uh, uh, than I was back then. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, let me continue with this line of questioning. So the same question to each of the three of you. What personality trait do you think has been the greatest impediment to your success? Or if you prefer, you can tell us about a trait that you found helpful, and you can, and you can decline to answer. Uh, let's start, we'll start with you, Clarence. Um, you know, I, I finally figured out I'm pretty much an introvert. And that turned out to be one of the traits that was enormously helpful. For working that out, I thank my law clerks and Susan Cain for pointing out, at least in her book, uh, Quiet, the traits that you have. I think that's been very helpful to me because I've been able to sort things out uh, uh, that were very, very difficult uh, quietly. Um, the other thing I think for me over the years, and whether I was teaching myself algebra or typing or uh, working alone, it was persistence. I'm very comfortable with doing things over and over until I learn them. I mean, even here, uh, I found law school enormously elusive and learning, going over, reading the tax revenues and the tax regulations over and over till, I ma till it made sense. I think it only made sense when I threw the volumes out. But um, <laughs> I just think, I think persistence, I also think uh, respect for others' opinions, I think has been very helpful to me. But uh, it, as far as something that gets in the way, um, I really can't think of that many things. I, I try to work with others in a way that it is cost-free for them to disagree with me. Thank that you. it doesn't, there's no penalty uh, that I can respectfully and clearly disagree, but not in a way that you think, oh, I'm going to make this guy angry or he's going to blow up or there's, we're going to have some unpleasantness. Uh, so it works fine for me on the court. I'm sure my colleagues can think of those things that I just gave you as stubbornness or bullheadedness. <laughs> um, but to me, that would be an, an incorrect assessment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could ask a couple of your colleagues, but I'll, I'll not do that right now. Uh, Sonia. I think to be successful generally, and I probably each of us will say he used the word persistent, I use the word stubborn. Yeah. Um, they're flip sides of the both things. You just don't want to give up, and so you don't. Um, I do think you have to respect people, yeah. and you have to like them. Um, but in direct answer to your question, I have a trait that's been enormously helpful and enormously harmful at the same time. I have an incredible power of concentration. When I am involved in something, whether it's reading, and I have described this before in my office, people would stand outside my door to talk because I would never hear them. Once I was working, I shut everything out. That could be very helpful for absorbing information and thinking about it when you're not distracted. Harmful is that that's what happens to me when I'm on the bench. And I'm involved in an argument and I become sort of oblivious to the world around me. And I'm just trained in on the person who I'm engaged with. And I'm seeking an answer and so to some it seems that I'm being combative when I'm really just searching for an answer. And that has held me in bad stead. Interesting. And, um, and I think that it, it sometimes still does. And I try and I'm trying harder as each year passes to correct some of that. But um, I think, I hope, because I have to soothe myself, that we all can see the good in ourselves and admit some of the bad too. Thank you. Sam. Uh, impediments, more, more than I can think of that I can mention, um, but one has been, one has been mentioned already. Um, probably would have been better if I said a bit more at various times. Uh, you mentioned that I'm going to see uh, Judge Garth, for whom I clerked. He, his joke is that I said two things to him during the course of 
the year that I spent with them. Hello, Judge, on the first day, and goodbye, Judge, on the day <laughs> <laughs> when I left. I don't think that's exactly accurate. Um, <laughs> traits that have served me well. Uh, well you, you became, you were very close friends with him and yes, served together. Yes, it was a wonderful circuit. experience. He's a, a, a great, great mentor, and he's now. Uh, in his 90s, he's been doing active work for my old court for the Third Circuit until this past summer. And he's now, he's still mentally very sharp and he lives uh, near here. So uh, that's an added benefit of my trip up here this weekend that I'll have a chance to see him. Traits that have served me well, um, I think one of, if not my single favorite movie is Being There. I think if you remember that movie, um, being in the right place at the right time, that's, uh, that's the best. Yeah. <laughs> I tell my students that about clerkships. Sometimes it's just being there at the right time. Um, so let me get on a bit of a lighter, uh, lighter note. Um, beyond sharing a passion for the law, uh, each of you is also a passionate sports fan. Sam and Sonia, you are famously ardent baseball fans, the man from central New Jersey being a Phillies fan, and Sonia from the Bronx, of course, a Yankees fan. And I thought I might have another commonality, but Clarence, I can't, have you ever gone to a baseball game? You know? Uh, you are, however, I understand, with your wife, Ginny, um, a devoted fan of the Nebraska Huskers. Ginny's from Nebraska. Is, is that why you're a Huskers fan? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I really, really like my wife a lot. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm on a budget about it. The, um, <laughs> and I really liked her mother. And she, her mother really liked me. So my advice to people who get married, look out for the mother-in-law. <laughs> the, um, but they were big Nebraska fans. And I also like the fact that the players graduate. I just think it's wrong for these kids to go to school and use up their eligibility and possibly their health and they don't graduate. And Nebraska they graduate. The kids graduate. And I think even at this moment we're dispensing or dispatching with Rutgers. So hopefully that's over by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh I want to ask you, beyond sports, what you do with your leisure time, if you have any, when you're not on Supreme Court duty. Uh, and this round, I'm going to give the answer, and then uh, you're going to tell me whom I'm referring to in the style of the old What's My Line TV show. Okay. One of you inspired a coffee shop to name one of its blends Bold Justice. Who do you think? <laughs> okay. Do you want to ask the audience to participate? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, a little story behind it. This, is, uh, this comes from my days uh, on the Third Circuit. My chambers was in Newark. And right around the corner from the, court shop, uh, the courthouse, there was an old coffee shop that long, long predates Starbucks and all the new things. This goes back to the 19th century. One year I had law clerks who liked coffee but they didn't want to make coffee. And this coffee shop had a, a promotion. You could sign up for a year and go in every morning and fill up a big thermos of coffee and so you'd have coffee for the year. And so they, as a promotion, they said that if during the course of the year you sampled every blend of coffee that they made, then you could create your own blend at the end of the year and name it. So they did that, and this involved a lot of sacrifice because there were blends like blueberry coffee and <laughs> horrible things. They suffered through all that, and so then they created this, they created this blend, uh, which is designed for about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, if you're working and you're starting to fall asleep, if you have this, it will uh, jolt you awake. So that's the, the story behind it. The, the clerk who was the leader, the, the coffee expert among the three, who, uh, the four who did that, um, has ended up as a, a law professor 
And of course, where would he go? To Seattle, the <laughs> teachers at the University of Washington Law School. So it sounds like you're serious about your coffee. Yes. Yeah. What, what type do you drink? Strong. <laughs> <laughs> and Sonia, serious about coffee? Oh, very much so, but I've had to give it up. Oh, um, you have. Yeah, and so, but I still get sent uh, regularly pounds of coffee from Puerto Rico because they know I was an avid coffee drinker, and so everybody sends me coffee. That's great. I have an office full of it, a home full of it, uh, friends have it. Just get on my list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Clarence. Oh, Folger and uh, Dunkin' Donut are fine. <laughs> <laughs> Folger? I didn't know Folger was made of it. Well, I, you can see I'm, an, I'm not, I'm eclectic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not particularly, I'm not a, a connoisseur. One of you... That's pretty obvious, right? <laughs> <laughs> One of you enjoys uh, traveling cross-country with your spouse in a 40-foot RV. Who's that? Well, that's technically incorrect. <laughs> it's not an RV. It is a motor coach. <laughs> is that bigger than an RV? N well, it could be, but it is a better vehicle than an RV. And <laughs> an RV is normally So you're built kind of sure about some things. Yeah, an RV is normally built on a light truck chassis. A motor coach is a tour bus. So, at any rate, yes, He I, is a connoisseur <laughs> about some things. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's old, but it's really nice. Um, the, uh, I do travel on it, and it is, this is a wonderful country. We've been doing it for 15 years, and um, we've been through Connecticut. We've seen western Connecticut, Massachusetts, um, other parts of New England, upstate New York, the Adirondacks, and then the west, the south. Uh, it's an amazingly beautiful country, so we've had an opportunity to drive around. And do people ever come up to you and say you look like Clarence Thomas? Well, it happened. Well, after Bush v. Gore, you all probably don't recall that case. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, the one thing about these old motor coaches is you spend a lot of time repairing them. So my wife, I would take it in, and it was constantly being repaired. She said, "Say, oh, I get it." This always goes on, right? So you're always taking it to be repaired. It was scheduled the week that we had Bush v. Gore to be in Florida. Of course, I had to drive it there. And um, the, so I rescheduled, and the week after, things were a little bit dicey driving down to Florida. And uh, I stopped in Brunswick, Georgia, at a uh, Flying J truck stop. Not many people even know those places exist, but it's actually pretty interesting. So I'm refueling, which is an interesting experience, with uh, all the 18-wheelers, uh, and one of the truckers walks by as I'm refueling, and he says to me, uh, did anybody ever tell you you look like Clarence Thomas? <laughs> And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, I bet it happens all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and then he went on about his business. That was it. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it, I it did happens. not know that answer. Okay, one of you is a passionate salsa dancer, and I guess we know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> That's me again. <laughs> Tell us about your career in salsa, and I want to ask you also, does any other justice... Dan Salsa. Oh, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> that last part I doubt very much. Um, I asked my mom what I did as a child because uh, we had parties in my home for most of my early childhood at my grandmother's home. And I know that most of my cousins can dance, but I couldn't. And she said every time lessons started, you would run off and do something else. Um, I later found out I'm pitch deaf, so it doesn't help dancing when you're pitch deaf. It's supposed to not help singing, but I can't keep a beat to save my life, okay? So I lived like a potted plant. There's an expression in Spanish. And I lived like a potted plant most of my adulthood. And as I was turning 50, I had gone on to 
um, the Court of Appeals, and I kept getting invited to Hispanic events where salsa was being played. And I would sit there as all these guys were asking me to get up and dance. And I was single um, for those women in there. <laughs> and I finally decided, you know, this is something that I just want to change. So I took lessons. Oh, great. And I found out that I am totally cannot keep a beat to save my life. <laughs> Doesn't matter what I do, can't keep a beat. But I have a facility that some of my colleagues would find very strange. I can follow. <laughs> That's good. That's and this will fall a little flat in this audience, except among the Hispanics here. If my partner can keep a beat and I can see it, I can follow it. So among Hispanic men, the best dancers in terms of keeping a beat are Dominicans. Is that the worst are Cubans because they have, <laughs> Dominicans have big, big steps. That's profiling it. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it proves itself right a lot. And Cubans have these very tight little steps. I never dance with a Cuban. Um, and Puerto Ricans I can dance with too. I, I'm, I, I'm not only partially jesting because before I say yes to anybody who asks me to dance, I have to watch them first to make sure I can follow them. So if you can't lead, you follow. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> You're going to be in trouble with the Cubans. I now, know, I know. My next question is. But they're very sounds, elegant. Excuse me, you know, I got to tell you. My husband always says he's the only Puerto Rican who doesn't know how to dance. Ah. I keep a V. Jose, I'll so give now, you the name of my instructor, okay? <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a revelation to know that Sonia likes to follow. I think we're going to start dancing in the conference. <laughs> Well, now you know. No. <laughs> Getting to know you better, I'm going to ask a question that sounds banal, but it works really well when Brian Lamb asks it um, on C-SPAN. Uh, tell us about a book you've read recently and uh, why it was good. Sam? Oh, boy. Well, I have two books that are inspirational and I keep them on the table by my bed. I try to read them a little bit every night. It's uh, My Grandfather's Son in My Beloved World. <laughs> <laughs> Quick thinking. Uh, Akil Amar is raising each book up. He, he's keeping it with his two constitutions in his pocket. <laughs> right. I, I, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, I, I try to read other things other than the law over the summer. Um, and, uh, but then when the summer comes to an end, I always vow, you have to keep this up. You can't just read briefs because most, so much of our, our lives is reading an incredible amount of uh, legal materials. So uh, this, this summer, I, I found, and I also love lists, so I, I found a list of, of short works, things that you can read in a day, and I've, that's my vow for the coming, I started it already, and that's my, my vow for the coming term. So a lot of things, some things that I had read many years ago, like uh, a story from Dubliners, and I had read in high school, and I, I reread it, and I said, wow, you didn't really understand this back when you were 17 years old, uh, but some very, you know, very moving things like that. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing now. Sounds good. So well, I do a combination of legal books and non-legal books. Um, the, the summer, I, I read a book on my colleague, Nino Scalia, um, and I'm not going to rank it, okay? Um, <laughs> he didn't write it, so it's about him, okay? Um, and I'm 
also read Justice Stevens' books on the amendments he would propose if he had the power. Uh, in terms of fun things, because like Sam, you want to escape from it, I read because my college roommate, um, and some of you may know from my book that my college roommate told me which ca classics to read, and she send, still sends me books. Um, and it was The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Oh, yeah. And I loved that book. Not only did it teach me science in an understandable way, but it had a very moving and, in, at least to me, impactful description of how science not only changes the world, but the individuals affected by it. To me, it was beautifully done and incredibly um, interesting. On my nightstand is a personal book. It's Timeless Morgenthau and Me. Bob Morgenthau was my first boss, and his wife, Lucinda Franks, has written a book. And it's a little bit of law, because it talks about his cases, but it's really about him and her as people. Yeah. And I'm enjoying it. Um, so you pick up the things your friends, I do, friends recommend things to me. There are things that I just have a personal interest in, so it varies. Great. Clarence, a recent book, and why it was Well, good. I must admit, I do, you know, it's, I, I, I'm one of these, I think reading's a gift, and it's a gift that I prayed for and when I was a kid, and just very thankful for it, but I, I read quite a bit. Uh, but I agree to do things, uh, to teach courses and things I'm interested in, and I just recently agreed to teach a law and literature class well, for the last two years, at least one class on law and literature. And this year we were doing Native Son. Uh, Native Son is, to me, one of the, it certainly was critical in my own development, in my own life, and there's so much in there. Um, so I've reread that many times, and most recently reread it a few weeks ago. Um, last year we did To Kill a Mockingbird, which I've read countless times, but each time, it's one of these things that each time you read it, you see something different. Um, and where I read is this a, that you're teaching? It was at George Washington University, uh -huh. a seminar on law and literature. I'm teaching another course. It's uh, actually the stories behind uh, constitutional law uh, precedent. Uh, this is my fourth year. That's full semester. And I taught another one on Swift v. Tyson for, uh, to Erie v. Tompkins which is another set of readings. So you can see I really need a full-time job. But, <laughs> but it's, what, what it does is it forces me to read a different way things that, become imp that were important to me, are important to me, and that are helpful uh, in thinking about things. But um, uh, reading Richard Wright at this point in my life is quite different from when I first when read When did you first read it? Pardon me? When did you first read Native Son? I was 16. I was in the seminary. I was uh, the only black kid in the seminary. And you react quite differently. I read it again uh, during my college years, during my law school years. It was a bad time to read it here, and then I read it afterwards. I've read it many times. But at each stage, you see different things, or you see things differently, or from a different perspective. Well, Judge Alito gave my answer which uh, I read your, both your memoirs um, already and then reread them in preparing for today, and terrific. And I'm sure our audience will look at it. Sam, you gotta get moving here on, on the memoir. <laughs> um, I wanna move on to, your, to law school and your pre-Supreme Court careers. So let me first ask about your time at Yale Law School. Let us in on some formative episodes, good or bad, and I know that uh, Sonia and Clarence have written some about this. You can tell us something that's in your books or something else entirely. And Sam, you can tell us whether it's really true that you uh, sat at the front of class, didn't take a note, never raised your hand, and got all the answers right. It sounds good, so I'm not going to deny it. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned about... Anyway, um, formative, interesting things that happened. I, I had some wonderful courses, some wonderful classes, some great some great professors. Um, the, uh, we were walked o I, I was walked over to the law school this morning by a, a first-year student. I think that maybe they thought I couldn't find my way here, but I, 
had a good chance to talk to him on the way over. I asked him what courses he was taking and who was teaching them, and he said, well, my, I'm taking torts, and uh, Guido Calabresi is teaching the course. So, so many things have changed here since <laughs> I was... <laughs> But it's good that one thing, you know, that some things do stay the same. He was a, a wonderful teacher, and uh, I'm happy to hear that he's doing very well after some, some recent surgery. Um, I had some um, other uh, very, very good courses. Um, I was reminded earlier this week of moot court because I judged a moot court. And every time I do that, I remember participating in moot court here, and in particular, uh, I marveled that I somehow made it to the final round because uh, of an incident that I, I mentioned to the students I spoke to this morning. During one of the preliminary rounds, one of the judges was just hammering me with one particular question. He asked me the question, I answered it as best I could, he asked the same question again, I tried again, I don't know how many times this went on. And then, he sa and then I said, I'd like to move on to my other argument. He said, you haven't answered my question to my satisfaction yet. And my response was, well, I've answered it to my satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> this, was an incre this is an incredibly open-minded person who let me move on to the, <laughs> the next round after that. That's great. Uh, Sam, I never knew that about you. <laughs> What are you, Clarence? Oh, I think, I, I think of law school as a blur. Um, the, there were some good people who were very, very good to me. You mentioned um, Dean Post, mentioned uh, Dean James Thomas, who was very good to me. I consumed a lot of his time. Um, there are professors here, Boris Bitker, Quentin Johnstone, Marvin Charles Dean, Harry Wellington. Um, they were all very, very good to me and spent time with me. Boris Bitker, um, the, what a gentleman. Uh, Joe Bishop spent time with me when I took a couple of his courses. Um, I just found it stimulating. I also loved, I had a group of friends, um, uh, back then you were required, I think, to eat at least one meal at the law school or something. So there was a group of us who met in the mornings, uh, Levita Coleman, um, and mostly kids who lived in the dorm. And we would just meet at breakfast. I thought that was one of the uh, delightful times. I would never miss that. I think it was at 8 o'clock or something. Um, the, I also had some study groups uh, that were just delightful. The rule was if you didn't contribute, you were booted out. I was not the enforcer. But it was a wonderful, that was tax and corporate finance, some of those courses. So I found those interesting. But I must admit that I did not get as much out of the law school as I should have. And that was simply because of my attitude, in which I encouraged the students this morning not to replicate. And the, it, was, it was a very difficult time, and there was a lot of negativity on my part. Okay. Sonia? Clarence, I really didn't know how to take full advantage of the law school. Yeah, good point. You know, um, given our backgrounds and the fact that we didn't have anybody in law or related to law, I did the things that sounded like you had to do, do the law journal. Um, I would have moot court seemed like too much writing <laughs> to me. So I did Barrister's Union, okay? Um, and I was already doing plenty of writing and other activities. But until Jose talked to me about clerking, and that was in my third year of law school, I hadn't heard about clerking. I hadn't thought about it. So I do think that there are kids who come still today to Yale who don't come with enough knowledge of the system to know how to take full advantage. I understand that there's now sort of um, talk with students in, my, in our position, mm. but I, I'm, I think some of it is us too. I think you make a good point. Um, I found about, out about the clerkships uh, about two years after I was gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, look, I'm not going to repeat what's in my book. I hope those of you who haven't read it will. Um, <laughs> but I will say that, that um, you know, uh, in, in high school, I said this to the students this morning, in high school, I was um, near the top of my class in valedictorian. And in college, you may have heard I graduated with honors. I got to Yale, and I learned a deep sense of humility. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, because sitting next to my classmates, listening to them in class, taught me how much smarter so many other people were, and how smart has different faces. Very interesting, resonating with you there, Clarence. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, I, I tend to agree. It, for me, it was more, um, there was this, by the time you leave, I left, there was a sense of confidence that I had an assessment of where I needed to be. And then it was a question of, of would I make the commitment to get there? But I think, uh, Sonia is absolutely right. There was a lot we didn't know. And of course, there's some things I'm involved in now where we try to bridge that gap for talented kids from, from difficult backgrounds or challenging backgrounds. But the, I do think that, um, that Yale, when I left Yale, uh, I had a sense of how bright or how much others knew and how much I needed to learn to be where they were. And that would take years. So it was just simply a matter. That's where I go back to the point about persistence. Was I going to be persistent enough and have the will to continue preparing to get there? So, so let me talk a little, or ask a little bit about getting there. Um, this is another commonality. After you left Yale Law School, uh, you each started your careers as government attorneys, and not government attorneys in Washington, D.C. Um, Clarence, you served as an assistant attorney general in Missouri, doing tax work primarily under John Danforth, our graduate. Sam, your first job after the Army Reserves and your clerkship with Judge Garth was to serve as an assistant U.S. attorney in New Jersey. And Sonia, you mentioned you went from law school to serve as an assistant district attorney under our graduate, the great Bob Morgenthau. Um, another commonality is, of course, at some point, each of you got on a U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, we want to know how these post-law school experiences shaped you. I don't want to say shaped you as a justice, because then you might not want to answer it. So I'll just say shaped you. Um, uh, maybe we could start with you, Clarence. Which of your jobs, um, and there are a lot of them, uh, which of these was, I'm going to put it this way, the most important preparation for the Supreme Court? And just so the audience knows, and Robert mentioned some of these, you were in the M Missouri Attorney General's office, uh, then two years in-house at Monsanto, or a year and a half. You worked on the Hill as an aide to Senator Danforth. You served as Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the Department of Education. And you served as chair of the EEOC before your year and a half on the DC circuit. So which of these was the most important preparation? Oh, well, first of all, I was in Missouri. I probably wound up in these jobs. I don't want anyone to think that I had some conscious plan. I mean, I couldn't get a job. That's how I wound up in Jeff City. Um, that was the only job offer I had. Um, the I would have to say each job was a good job. And even the difficulties were opportunities to learn uh, and to grow. And that's the way I looked at them. And not all of them were the most gratifying or fulfilling jobs, but I've not had a bad job. Uh, the job in Jeff City was the best job I've ever had. Because it, because it was the only job you could get? <laughs> well, that was a part of the reason. <laughs> But it was Jack Danforth, and he's a good man. Um, and it was more work. He said he could promise us more work for less money than anybody in the country. <laughs> and 
he delivered on that in space. <laughs> but it was a wonderful, wonderful learning opportunity. The best job I had for me personally among the jobs I've had to prepare me for what I do, I would have to say EEOC. Um, Tell us about that. Well, EEOC was, there were a lot of challenges. Um, you can just, I mean, I'm not going to go back and regurgitate all of the, those things or relive that, but there were challenges and uh, there, was, there were criticisms and I was constantly in trouble. Uh, <laughs> So they got you, got you prepared. Well, I mean, that was just, but you learn how to be, make calm, be, remain calm and make hard decisions uh, under uh, difficult circumstances. And you learn to double check and recheck, make sure you're right. Um, also, you learn how not to become unpleasant because there's unpleasantness around you to accept certain things. Uh, you couldn't always uh, become or retaliate. Uh, so I would have to say EEOC, and I also learned that people who work closely with you uh, appreciate you being loyal and good to them as Jack Danforth was to me from 1974 on, and to be, try to be a good model. But I would have to say EEOC taught me that discipline and that calmness in difficult circumstances. Right. Sam? You, you spent four years as an assistant U.S. attorney in New Jersey, where I gather a big portion of your caseload was appeals to the Third Circuit. And then you went to the Solicitor General's office, arguing 12 cases before the Supreme Court. Uh, after that, you spent two years as deputy at OLC. And then you were appointed by the president to be the U.S. attorney for the District of New Jersey. Uh, Tell us about these, and the, the latter is particularly interesting. You went from being a legal eagle most of your life to now running an office. Uh, what was that like? It was a lot of fun. It was the biggest change in, in my career, uh, a lot different from what had gone before and radically different from what came after. I think that being a, a circuit judge, particularly on, on my old court and on I think probably most of the regional courts of appeals where the judges are geographically spread out is one of the most isolated legal jobs that exists. Um, other courts may operate differently, but on, on my old court, and we got along very, very well, but I could go literally for weeks without ever seeing another human being at work except for uh, the people in my, my own office. Uh, the U.S. Attorney job was completely different. In, in, on the Court of Appeals, basically all I did was read and write and occasionally and exchange emails with my colleagues every six weeks, go to Philadelphia for oral arguments. On the, in, the U.S. Attorney's office was a big office by the standards of the day, 65 attorneys, and there was always something happening, um, uh, always exciting. Every day when I came in, I might have things that I planned to do, but there would be a dozen things that I hadn't planned. Good things, not so good things. Uh, uh, the, the assistants would come in, do you know what judge so-and-so is doing in this case? And so we'd have to deal with that problem. Um, different, um, uh, the heads of different investigative agencies came in. Uh, so it was, it was fascinating. It did not involve very much reading. It did not involve uh, a lot of uh, deep legal analysis, but it was a it's a very practical job, uh, trying to make sure that everybody in the office was moving in the right direction and was uh, handling their cases and their investigations properly. Um, Sonia, after serving under Bob Morgenthau, uh, you were in private practice for nine years. As Robert mentioned, you then served for five years as a district court judge, making you the only justice with that experience. How have these different roles and positions informed your perspective on the law? I had a thought, even from law school, that you knew the profession was moving towards specialization and at some point that I would have to pick an area. But even in law school, I spent time learning about 
different fields that I thought made a more well-rounded lawyer. And so I, even though I was specializing in international law at law school a little bit, uh, hence my note, um, I took corporations, I took contracts too, I took evidence, I took taxation, I took estates and trust. The, all of the subjects that I thought made a well-rounded attorney. And when I got to the DA's office, and, and there, was just, there was some frustration there. A state court is very different than a federal, a state prosecutors, prosecution is very different than state prosecution. Resources are scarce. The people involved in the work are well-meaning, but also sometimes not well-trained. Um, and witnesses are often scared, and we don't have the federal resources of witness protection in the same way. So you had to cajole a lot of people to bring in cases. After four and a half years, I decided that I had rounded out the criminal side of my lawyering, and I wanted to move and learn something about the civil side. So I went to a commercial law firm, but I did everything. Uh, as a litigator. Uh, name the field of, now I have a subspecialty in, inter, uh, in intellectual property, but I did estates there. I handled real estate matters. I, I, I did handled banking matters, securities matters. You name it, I did a little bit of everything and some big things as well. Um, I think that that prepared me for the district court. For the district court? Yes. I actually, watching judges who have become judges recently, a lot of them come from specialties. And I think they have a narrower on basics of law than I had developed more, a more wide basis of legal knowledge starting my district court job. And even with that, there was a ton new to learn. Somebody, I think, mentioned Derissa um, in one of my conversations recently. I've learned a lot of ERISA. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the district court, well, let me tell you a story, and I won't. Uh, last year I was having lunch with the chief and Justice Kagan, and it was just the three of us, and we started talking about how hard our uh, senior justices worked in the various federal circuits. And Without thinking about it, out of my mouth came, when and if I retire, I'm going to go back to the district court. And when asked why, I said, why would I want to go do what I've been doing for however many years it's been on the appellate court and on the Supreme Court? I want to go back to my first love. And the district court is a very different and exciting place. And at least for me, it was the formative experience of preparing me for the court. Because I still look at cases a lot like district courts do, district court judges. I look at the facts, and I try to apply the facts to law. And my colleagues look at the law. Yeah. And that's all sometimes they're looking at. And so it's a very different perspective, and one that I will never disavow because I think it has value. And so, um, for me, my greatest time was on the district court in terms of preparing me for the Supreme Court. And Sam, what, how about being, was being U.S. attorney or arguing cases in the Supreme Court? Which of those two things do you think you took the most from now sitting as a justice? Uh, arguing is much more closely related, obviously, to what I'm doing. So it had a, it had, that had a greater effect. But I, I treasured the experience of being U.S. attorney. Because that's also very much district court. Um, so it's, we sort of moved on to your service on the Supreme Court. And uh, one initial question, what surprised each of you most when you got to the court? Sam, you must have been pretty familiar with it, but did anything surprise you? M mundane or important? Well, as far as mundane uh, matters, um, we are very, very 
we're, we're more formal in the way we operate internally than I was used to on the Court of Appeals. The work that we do is not that much different. Two-thirds of our cases come from the, from the federal courts of appeals, but we're more formal in the way we, we operate. Um, our oral arguments are more formal on the Court of Appeals. There was rarely anybody present besides the lawyers who were arguing the cases, and so if the time expired and any judge had more questions, more time would be given, or if the lawyers hadn't covered everything, more time would be given. You really can't do that uh, when you have nine on the bench and you have um, uh, the, the kind of schedule that we have. Um, we're, we're very, uh, our internal operations are, are very old-fashioned. Um, we still send around, we don't communicate with each other at all by email. Uh, all, my, all my communications with my colleagues on the Third Circuit were by email. On the Supreme Court, uh, it's all done uh, by hard copy. We still have spittoons by our seats on the bench. <laughs> Now, Sam, let me ask you that. So you said being on the Court of Appeals, a regional Court of Appeals, at least one that's got many states, is isolating or isolated. Now you're all in the same building. I thought you were going to say our communications are by telephone or by face-to-face. -face. But you said they're by written communication. The communications about cases are almost always written, except when we're in conference and we're we're talking there, but uh, there are some, and there's nothing wrong with it, communications that are, that are um, oral, but uh, if, you are, if you have comments about someone's opinion, a draft opinion, the, the, ex the standard procedure is to write a letter and circulate it to, to, everybody, um, to everybody on the court. We are together a lot more. So it's much, it's a much, for me, it's a much less isolated job. We're in the same city, we're in the same building, uh, we're together many more days, the days when we have arguments, the days when we have conferences. Um, we have lunch together very frequently, so we see each other a lot more than I, I, I did on my old court. Clarence? Oh, I, I can't say I was surprised. I had no idea what I got <laughs> myself into. Uh, the, it was very formal. I, I like formality. I don't like a lot of the informal stuff. I, your, uh, your old boss, uh, Byron White, uh, he would send around uh, a memo, Clarence, dear Clarence, I don't agree with the thing you said. Cheers, Byron. <laughs> <laughs> Every letter was cheers, Byron. <laughs> um, I, I like the formality of it. I, it, it there's a little, it's a little disconcerting because we're all in the same building and we don't see each other that much except when we're sitting or we have conference. Um, I usually come in, I go to my chambers, I work, and I go back to the basement, get in my car and go home. Um, I use email, but when I first got to the court, there was not internal email. Uh, so I don't think we have gotten there yet, but I think in time we will start communicating by internal email. I was in charge in, in those days of the automation. So we have all that now. We have all the track changes and we could do a lot of things on the computer on a document together, but we don't do it. I do it with my law clerks, but as between each other, I think people prefer hard copies and things like that. But I work paperless, almost exclusively paperless, intra-chambers. Uh, and we could do it. I think at some point we'll do it in the court. Um, the thing that surprised me, though, is just how warm everybody was when I got there. I mean, I, um, uh, the, I was pleasantly surprised by that. I was pleasantly surprised by how engaged everyone was. For example, I would walk from an argument with John Stevens, who is a delightful man and a brilliant man, and he would just, um, you could start talking about cases that you had earlier in the week or you were working on an opinion and he was fully engaged. Uh, or you, Justice O'Connor, same thing. It, it was a wonderful environment and I just thought it was um, an environment where people weren't raising their voices but they were actually uh, thinking that the, they, they were of the view, it appeared to me, that the work was more important than they were. 
and that our job was to turn out the best product that we could. That's the court that I came to, and that's the way I think the court is now. Um, the, I was very pleasantly surprised at how much work it took. Uh, and I, I came on the court, I was 40 years younger than Justice Blackman at the time, and I said, well, you know, he's doing this in his 80s, so it can't be all that hard. Well, <laughs> <laughs> at the end of my first term, he was cruising along, and I was just, I, was, I had fallen along the way, you know. <laughs> but uh, the, I think you learn, as your boss used to tell me, Clarence, you got to get a system. And um, you have to learn how to do this job systematically. But, uh, you know, I have to say the number one thing for me was just, how warm and respectful and dignified the people were with whom I worked, whether they agreed with you or didn't. That was my biggest surprise. Sonia? I was surprised by all of this as well. Yeah. Um, but for me, uh, the tradition had one positive thing, which it taught me that um, the court as an institution was much more important than I was and as an individual justice. And that is really a, a very important lesson, I think, for justices to learn and to live by. And so sometimes the tradition, though, is, a, you know, sometimes it's a little silly. Um, you know, at lunch, we have to sit in our press, press, uh, press why have I forgotten, the, <laughs> our, our previous justice's chair. Yeah. And that's not by seniority, yeah. but that chair has been sat on by all the judges, the line. And justices in your lineage, okay? And when someone moves, you see a lot of eyebrows raised, okay? Uh, why are you sitting there? Yeah, why are, why are you sitting there, you know? I, I'm sorry, I've fallen prey to that. What are you doing here, Sandra? <laughs> um, it, it, it is, it can be overwhelming at times, a tradition. Um, I think that there's two reasons why the justices don't use technology so much. One is tradition, but the other is that some of them don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then there's that. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> now, the, the almost 90-year-old justice when I came to the court, Justice Stevens, actually did use emails. Yeah. And, and, but his, you know, you could send him something and he would respond. Yeah. Um, but it was very short, <laughs> so I knew he wasn't a great typist, okay? Um, but colleagues who you might be otherwise surprised don't. I think the, the most computer savvy justice is you, Clarence. Oh, I don't... I think so. Uh, well, you know, actually, in his defense, uh, Justice Stevens was my ally in automating the agency. Uh, I think that's because, probably... Uh, he actually was a very, very productive man. And people used to make fun of him when he went to Florida, but we dreaded when he went to Florida because he would start churning all this stuff out. <laughs> and he was always on his computer, but um, we want him to just come back. You know, you're like 80% as productive as you are in Florida, but I just thought he was a wonderful ally. In fact, if the, he, uh, when there was some consternation early on about automation, he was one of the people I could count on to always help me uh, convince my colleagues to, to, to move in that direction. Now, I will say something, um, a different view of the isolation that both of you talk about. I've chosen to be on the second floor, and I'm the only justice that's up there. And I recognize it's a problem because I'm separated from my colleagues. And you know those steps down yeah. are sometimes they seem a bigger barrier than they should. And so I don't just decide, as I've done before when I was in other courts and uh, my colleagues were nearby, to just walk by and plop myself down to say hello. And I keep telling myself I have to do it and I don't. But we have colleagues who do that. And I think it's just part of the- Steve Breyer? <laughs> and a couple of others. Yeah. Um, and, and we do have some colleagues who like doing it and doing it. I think it's personality. I, I, I really do think it's you know, what we're most comfortable with as individuals. Yeah. 
With respect to the question, um, Kate, that you asked, I've often said, you know, I felt prey to what I think the public does in reading our opinions. You read our opinion, you agreed with one side or another, and you think to yourself, now this was perfectly clear. This wasn't that hard to figure out. And then what you don't see is how difficult almost every case before us is. Yeah. It doesn't come to us unless there's a circuit split. And if there's circuit split, it's because some, and you know, some could argue this point, but the reality is that I think most of our Court of Appeals judges are reasonable people. And they're giving their best effort at giving an answer. And I find myself struggling a lot more than I anticipated. And yet when you write out. the opinion, all of you and your colleagues, you read the majority opinion and you read the dissenting opinion and each one seems quite confident they got it right. But you're saying well, it don't takes you a while to get there. You picked great lawyers. Yeah. Every one of us was an advocate. Every one of us can pitch the best argument on either side that you could raise. Now, once we've, com we've come to our conclusion, the purpose of opinion is to persuade. And you're going to do an opinion that you hope persuades. Even though you may be experiencing some initial doubt about the answer. I, don't, I, I, I think that, um, yes. for me, that part of it was very much a surprise. Very interesting. Sam? Have anything to add to this? Uh, no, what's maybe Sonia, what makes a case hard, or well, what Sonia said uh, about the difficulty of the cases is absolutely correct. Most of them are cases where there's a conflict. By definition, those are those are cases with respect to which there are two reasonable positions that you that you can take. Um, I keep in mind the fact that the last opinion of mine from the Third Circuit that went to the Supreme Court, which was an opinion for the on-bank court, was reversed by the Supreme Court nine to nothing. <laughs> and I'm still absolutely sure that I was correct. <laughs> the issue was whether a woman was ineligible for Social Security disability insurance benefits because she could do the last job that she previously had. This woman's last job was as an elevator operator. So I s said rather simple-mindedly that the ability to do your last job really shouldn't count if that job doesn't exist anymore anywhere in the real world. But the Supreme Court, in its great wisdom, said it doesn't matter whether the job <laughs> exists anymore. So I do keep that in mind. He's still a good lawyer. <laughs> it, still get it. it still bothers you, huh? <laughs> no, Clarence, no. I've gotten over it. <laughs> remember it very well. Um, well, speaking of your colleagues, there's, there's something ironic here. Yale Law School is, of course, supreme when it comes to populating law school faculties. And um, that's one fact. Another fact is that four of your colleagues were, at an earlier point in their careers, full-time law professors. Um, Breyer, Ginsburg, Kagan, and Scalia, those justices. So by that measure, this is the most academic court of all time. Yet none of the former professors are Yaleys, none of you. Um, so I'm getting to a question here. <laughs> are there too many former professors? <laughs> are there too many former appeals court judges? Uh, not enough of something else. Uh, and anyone can take this on. Well, as far as academics is concerned, we're at a dangerous tipping point. They're almost in the majority. Who knows what they'll do to us when they... Uh, when they have control. When they have control. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Being a, being a Court of Appeals judge is the perfect preparation for the Supreme Court. <laughs> no question about it. Uh, it's, it's helpful. I, I don't know whether that kind of 
you know, being a, a court of appeal, former court of appeals judge, being an academic, having held uh, an elected position, uh, I don't know whether that kind of diversity of experience is, is critically important. Uh, diversity of experience is very valuable, many different types of, of diversity. Uh, we are all, we all have, uh, as Sonia me uh, mentioned, very few people today have the kind of generalist background that she acquired. A lot of people spent a lot of their career specializing in some areas and we all have areas uh, where we have to we have to write opinions that are going to be binding on the on the country in areas where we have no background uh, for example um, I, I did not one bit of patent work before I went to the Supreme Court my first you know my first involvement in patent law is writing or in voting on on patent cases it's it's unavoidable that's going to be true for for all of us. So it, it is valuable for us to have certainly that kind of uh, uh, diversity as far as fields of, of specialization and knowledge. Anybody else care to comment on the observation of the court's makeup? And oh, I don't think it's... Justice it, Thomas, I, you've, turned, you've served on court, uh, different courts. It changed. Well, well, I'd served about two weeks on the Court of Appeals, but... Um, no, I mean on different Supreme Courts, if yeah. you think about new people coming You know, I, the, the, I have great respect and for, uh, you know, I think the, the work that our judges do. I mean, I think that they allow us. You were, the earlier question about confidence in the opinions, I don't think we can write, woe is me, oh, I'm having a hard time with this, I'm crossing the Rubicon and all that sort of stuff, you know. You have to write the opinion and you write it as best and as clearly as you can. But sometimes I think we write it in a way that belies the uh, insecurities we might have about or the uncertainties in the argument. And I think we have to be open in the next cases to, to um, re-examine that. That's something that I try to do in chambers, go back and, and make sure, rethink old opinions. But the, uh, as far as the makeup of the court, I, I don't feel uh, that I'm in a position to say who is better qualified. Uh, our colleagues who are academics are from the academic world. I mean, who would we replace? I like them all. And I think they're all fabulous. I mean, you don't have to agree with them to know. I mean, you don't have to agree with Justice Ginsburg to know she does fabulous work. And when you are in a uh, uh, sort of a disagreement with her, she's going to force you to do better work. Uh, the, so I just, I, I think I like the court the way it is. Uh, I do think we should be concerned that all of us are, virtually all of us, are from two law schools. Uh, the, I'm sure that, you know, Harvard and Yale likes that, but um, the, I think we should be concerned about that to some extent because this is a big country. I also think we might want to think about the fact that we, are, we have such a strong northeastern orientation when the countries, yep. there's a lot of country between here and the west coast. And so, I mean, there would be, those are my uh, peeves, but um, uh, I wouldn't, I couldn't say to you that somebody on the court who's been a colleague of mine should not have been there or shouldn't be there. They are wonderful people. I may have surprising, the dissenting view. Um, I, I, you know, any one individual doesn't represent anything. You don't represent the justice who's an elected official. You don't represent a justice who's come from a single practice. Um, and, and it's not as if you're going to be an advocate for an yeah. interest group. So justices don't play advocates in that sense of the word. But I do think that as you're evaluating the human condition, as you're talking about what you, how you expect the reasonable person to, re, to respond, how you talk about what a reasonable police officer would or would not do, and all of these questions that we look at constantly, it is helpful to have people with life experiences that are varied. Yeah. Um, just because it enriches the conversation. 
And so like Clarence, I'm horribly worried that we are not geographically diverse. And I don't, by the way, I didn't think the president was going to pick me because of that, but I'm surely happy that he ignored me, okay? And picked me anyway. Yeah. You know, it's hard to say who you would give up because nobody wants to say it should be them. <laughs> but I, I do think geographic, I think religious, uh, we all believe in God, but there are issues that come up in terms of reactions where having a different perspective may be useful. But I also think that we're missing things on the court. We're missing any judge, justice, who has had criminal defense experience. Everybody has either been a U.S. attorney, a government attorney. We don't have a civil rights lawyer except Ruth but we don't have one involved in general civil rights. She is gender, not general, although it doesn't mean she can't understand it. I think that's a type of practice that's different. Tony did a little bit of, Tony Kennedy did a little bit of solo practice, but his was a unique practice in California, and, uh, and it was a product of his dad. He joined his father. Um, We've got a lot of big firm lawyers, except for me, there's no mid firm, mid-size or small single practitioner. All, I think you need diversity, not just of yeah. life background, but of legal experience background. We're being asked to decide questions involving not just ordinary people, but the profession. And so I, I for one, yeah. If I had the power, which I don't, obviously, I would encourage the appoint, people who appoint justices or judges generally to look at that diversity. When senators asked me what I thought how they should pick nominees to the district and circuit courts, I would say, look at your bench and see what life experience or professional experience it's missing and look for people who can bring and enrich the court with that. Um, all of you have um, mentioned colleagueship and uh, I gather friendships on the court. Um, and of course, we, we, can't, we don't witness your, your interactions, uh, uh, both formal and informal. And as some measure of your colleagueship, I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna ask each of you to tell us something about one of the other two. And um, maybe something we might not know or something we do know. And I've chosen these pairings at random. So, Sonia, tell us something about Clarence. Um, Clarence knows the name of every employee in the courthouse from the lowest position to the highest, with virtually all of them. With virtually all of them, he knows their families, their happinesses, and their tragedies. Um, it is a, when Robert introduced him, he talked about his humanity and caring. That fact alone, when I learned it, made me understand that as much as we may disagree on a lot of legal issues, we don't disagree on the fundamental value of people. And you can respect someone who you disagree with legally if you start with that foundation in principle. Great, great. Thank you. Sam, can you tell us something about Sonia? And Clarence, you can figure out and you can start thinking ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if you read my book. <laughs> Every night. Um... <laughs> well, I, I think I'm not going to tell you something that you don't already know, but these are, are traits that I admire. Sonia is very independent. Uh, she is very, very, very thorough in 
her preparation, uh, not only on the merits cases, but on the, the hundreds of uh, cert petitions that we discuss uh, every term. Uh, she is very strong in her views, and she doesn't give up on the rest of us. <laughs> uh, even when she sees that we're going off and the a majority is going off in the, in the wrong direction, you might just kind of throw up your hands and say, well, what can I do? But she's, she has Assistant. hope. She has hope that she can convince us, and she makes, <laughs> she makes, good, she makes good arguments, and uh, sometimes she succeeds. Great. I've been called incessantly optimistic. <laughs> Clarence. Oh, goodness, she never gives up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just relist that. I'm sure I can get it one of you. The, um, uh, Sam is, first of all, he's married to Martha Ann, who is a delight, and, the, and who is a wonderful person. Uh, Sam is really smart, uh, really funny, uh, principled, and a man of his word. Um, I, and it's something I just, when you can look someone in the eye and he tells you something and you can take him at his word. Uh, that is a, a treasure. I, you know, I tell my law clerks often that a uh, reputation is hard to build and easy to lose. And I think with us, Sam has a wonderful reputation of integrity and honesty. Plus, he's really a funny guy. Okay. <laughs> and for some reason, he likes those Philadelphia teams, which I do not understand. <laughs> uh, Thankfully, the one time we had a bet, I won. <laughs> you had a bet and you won it. Um, when my first year on the bench, the Phillies and the Yankees were playing against each other, and we made a lunch bet. Um, I had to treat him to Philadelphia cheesesteak sandwiches, and he had to treat me to New York hot dogs and beer. And I got a really good lunch. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> you did, and I, it was not easy to find Brooklyn Lager at that time in Washington. We had to, we had to search right. a lot of places to find it. But unfortunately, this was a bet on the 2009 World Series. I think it's going to be a long time before we have it. Oh, <laughs> regrettably, I agree with you. Yeah, this year it's going to be Kansas City. But um, Justice Thomas, you mentioned that you often tell your law clerks reputation is hard fought and can easily be lost. Um, let me, as a final question, ask each of you, what's the best or the most important advice you gave to the students with whom you met this morning? Each of you met separately with 30 students chosen by lottery. Um, and Sam? I met with a really smart group of students who had the good sense not to ask me for advice. <laughs> and so I can't uh, tell you advice that I actually gave them, but I will tell you advice that I would have given them if they had asked me. Uh, I think I... <laughs> here just give advice without being asked. <laughs> Maybe it will filter out to them. I would have told them two things. The first, and, and I don't know how relevant this is to their own experiences because an awful lot of time unfortunately has passed since I was here as a student. The first is to, to find your own path. At least when I was here, there were a lot of really smart students who had been on an achievement track. So it, it, the, the question was not what really? What do I want to do next? But what is the thing to do next as I, as I compete to get into the best college and then get into the best law school and then get the best clerkship and then work for the best firm? Um, at some point, I think you need to to get off that track and ask what uh, what you personally want to do. Uh, and if you haven't done it before, at, when you graduate from law school, I think that's the time to do it. And the second is um, not to confuse your, your legal career with your life. Don't make your legal career your entire life. Don't define your worth in terms exclusively of what you do in your legal career. I know people from my law school class 
who did that, I think, and uh, it led to very unfortunate consequences. Uh, so I don't think, uh, that, that's advice I would have given, but uh, did not have the chance. <laughs> Thank you. Sonia? Well, I don't know what the students would say, um, but, I'll, but I'll change up a little bit of what I said. When I was looking into uh, which law schools to attend, I narrowed it to Harvard or Yale, and I talked, this is the age before the internet guys, okay? So I had to talk to people about both institutions. And every Harvard graduate that I spoke to, Harvard Law School graduate, would say the toughest years of my life, but I loved it. And every Yale alumni that I talked to would say the best years of my life. And that difference in response is what convinced me to come to Yale. And I've subsequently, through the years, thought about why I said the same thing. And I think it's important what Sam has said. Yes, there's tracking. But I think there's tracking because there's a model of success that people see and want to duplicate because that's the only model they know of. But the one thing I loved about Yale is it lets you be passionate about whatever you want it to be. Amen. I mean, you could work with whatever professor doing whatever kind of work you wanted to do, and people volunteered to do it. And they did it because it was important to them to do. And I love that. My friends in other institutions, now they'll remain nameless, um, are sort of picked by reason of how smart the professors think they are, or um, they're picked for programs based on that. I mean, when I was here, Law Journal, you wrote on. Um, and, and you could volunteer for almost any organization and get in. I hope that that's still the case. But my point basically is, I now echo Sam, I told the students, be happy here. I didn't finish my advice by saying, be happy by doing what makes you happy. Be passionate about what you're doing. And that is the value of what you're getting. Thank you. Clarence. Well, um, I guess I told them not to do what I did. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I... Um, and, and I think Sonia is right that there's a lot we didn't know. And I wish that I was at, I came here at a time where I could have been more positive uh -huh. because there was so much here that I walked right by because I had closed my eyes and my heart to it. Um, I credit Jack Danforth with a lot of opening my eyes to things. When I met him, again, through uh, Guido Calabresi, who did not teach me torts, uh, <laughs> the, he, he, I remember meeting him when he came on campus, and he was a young, tall uh, attorney general with that spot in his, in his hair. Great spot. And he, would, he clapped his hands really loud and said, Clarence, plenty of room at the top. Plenty of room at the top. I said, boy, that guy really is off his rocker. <laughs> but, but that was just how cynical and negative I was. And here he was, positive and energetic and believe in you, believe in, in the possibilities. And what I tried to, to convey to the students is that attitude of hopefulness. I mean, you're here. You're at one of the best, you're, if not the best law school in the nation. You're here. And make the most of it, the friendships, the, uh, the opportunities to learn, to do things, to grow. Uh, I also suggested to them that when they take a job, the jobs are wonderful. There are lots of great jobs, but if all thing else, all of the other things are equal, work for the person work for a good person. A good person 
can turn a difficult job into a wonderful job. And a bad person can turn a beautiful job into a miserable job. I was fortunate to work for Jack Danforth, and some people might not have thought the work was glamorous, but I got to work for a good man. And who, 40 plus years later, I think of in an even more positive light than I did when I worked for him in 1974. So I think it's important to work for good people, people of integrity, people who are positive. And finally, although I did not get a chance to say this to them, I do believe this. Uh, you treat people the way you expect to be treated, whether they deserve it or not. Um, that they are owed that. That is hard to do. A part of going through the things that Sonia uh, mentioned earlier is the ability to let things go, to forgive and to forget, to turn and to move on. That is not so easy, but you want to be forgiven. You want people to uh, give you a pass sometimes. You want people to think better of you, so you do it to others. So I feel very strongly that we are required to treat people the way that we want to be treated. And finally, I think even when it's hard, you are required to be honest, not to give in to fads, not to uh, go along to get along. I mean, I think a lot of people, I grew up under segregation, and I'm convinced that some people went along uh, because it was easier to do that than it was to oppose something that was dreadfully morally wrong in our society. We are so very proud of all of you, and uh, we're grateful to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.